and we've talked about how you have overcome so much. Let me just reintroduce everything here. You're watching in the Exceptional Conservative Show live on TECN TV. This is Open Heart Closed Case Night in remembrance of Shanice Milton, my daughter, who was killed five years ago. We are, our interest is to find justice for unresolved homicides, missing persons, teen suicides, uh, and as well, uh, child abuse cases. Uh, tonight we're talking about Marty McMillan Jr. and his murder. Uh, and how he was attempting to turn his life around and yet even in his death he finds the perplexing nature of injustice uh, and tonight we have with us one of the greatest advocates any person could possibly have on the face of the earth none other than Felicia Cook uh, his grandmother and warrior uh, for justice for him Felicia firstly we thank you so much for taking time out of your busy life to be with us uh, you have been fighting the good fight of faith uh, to bring justice to this particular issue. Can you tell us about your grandson, Marty McMillan? Yes, Marty was, uh, he's my firstborn. He's the love of my life. You know, he's, uh, been, he was like the purpose of my life. You know, my firstborn, I wanted a son and I only had one child and she was a girl. And uh, so when she birthed him, I was, I fell in love. He was uh, born premature, he fought for his life, he fought to stay in the world. Uh, Marty, you know, he, he was doing fine, he was between parents, they, they were fighting over him and everything. So, you know, with all the confusion and everything, being a little child that's going through all the, you know, back and forth and all this stuff, he was going through his parents, he ended up falling into the wrong hands of getting out there and uh, becoming a troubled teen. Um, you know, I was always in his corner, you know, trying to. Uh, I was always the buffer with his parents. I was always in his corner, and I was always the one that was going in the courtrooms, and, and every time he would get in trouble anywhere, I would always be the one there supporting him and try to encourage him and give him encouragement to, you know, change, turn his life around. I think yeah. a lot of being on my knees and probably all bruised up. God's probably was so tired of me begging him to help me with them. And finally, you know, Marty, um, the last time he got in trouble, you know, Marty could get good jobs. He graduated. From, he was graduating from school. He was going to school. He would. He would do, but he would get tired with the wrong people. Yeah. Um, Marty had a big heart. He cared about people. He was but an underdog. That's the way he was. He didn't like the bougie thing of thinking he was better than people. Yeah. You know, and that's the type of heart that he had. And I would try to explain to him that everybody was his friends and things like that. What we go through with these teens when they get caught up like that and. Marty Finally, finally come to the conclusion, you know, Grandma, you know, after all these years, you know, he began to see the light. The light began to come on, and he began to want to change and turn his life around. And I was so proud of him. This time he came home. I was looking for him, you know, trying to find him a job and trying to get him something that he could do to keep him out of trouble. And at the same time, he was working on himself. And he ended up getting himself into a friendship program for an electrician. Yes. And uh, he didn't think that he could do that with the fellas and things that he had on him. But this time it, it happened. You know, the light came on and he was a total different person. He had his, he was growing up, you know, he turned 21, he was growing up, he was trying to turn his life around, he was really looking forward to things and, you know, um, and so he was really trying to do the right thing and I was so proud of him. And um, he met a young lady. He wanted to, to go out and have a good time. He had been working and started this apprenticeship program, been working, you know, like those long hours out there. And he had to be to work at 5 o'clock in the morning and mm -hmm. all that type of stuff. And um, this particular weekend, he had worked overtime. He signed up for overtime. He found that he could do that, you know, and he was so proud of himself. And he said, if I have to work on Sundays, Grandma, I'll, I'll work on Sundays. I'll get it every day. <laughs> about this opportunity of becoming an electrician. His goals and admirations, he wanted to open up his own electrician business, and that was his plan, and that's what he had started focusing on, and we all were so excited and happy for Marty, you know, 
uh, I began to see a different person, you know, and I had prayed for that day. I had prayed for that, and uh, things had begun to turn around, and I, I was thanking God that I could finally see that, you know, Marty was going to be able to have a good life, and that's all I prayed that, you know, when I closed my eyes for good, that Marty would be able to take care of himself, and um that's the beginning to turn around. He met this girl in plenty of fish, and uh, he was going to go out that night. He had worked overtime, and uh, he went to meet this young lady, and uh, he, he never came back from that date. Wow. Uh, he never came back from that date. Yeah. Now, uh, now, Felicia, and I know that this is a very tough part. You and I have often had conversations about each of our cases. Uh, it is very, very difficult uh, to speak on these particular issues and you have been a profound uh, leader uh, on these particular charges and you fought the good fight when the police and the detectives didn't believe uh, that you could possibly um, get the help well let, let, let's just say that uh, they didn't believe you. No, they didn't. The first detectives that came out that his father called because, you know, uh, we began to know something was wrong and Marty was missing for three days. Um, mm -hmm. And it rained real hard and I couldn't think of if he was at work because he wasn't doing that construction work. Would they work in the rain like this? And uh, we began, I called his father to see if he was on his father's house. And his father was like, no, I haven't seen him. You haven't heard from him? You didn't know. Um, he, you haven't heard from him? I said, no. He said, something's wrong. I said, yeah. He said, I'm going to call the police. He lives in the district. I said, okay, and I'm going to call his job. And I live in Maryland. Yeah. And so that's when we began to find out that Marty's missing. When um, he and my daughter just went down to the police department, they reported him missing. Marty's father reported him missing in the district. And he reported him missing. And uh, my daughter came up, drove up from North Carolina. She lives in Charlotte. And they went to the police department to find out what was going on, why they hadn't heard anything uh, during that week. And they get down there and find out they hadn't even been assigned to anyone because Marty was 21 years of age. And they felt like, you know, no, but somebody's 21 years of age, we don't put out a, a missing on them until after 30 days. And, uh, we said, and his father was almost fainted, and he started to cry, and he said, 30 days, you're not going to look for my, my son until 30 days? And uh, this detective stepped up there and said he was getting ready to retire, but he would take the case. Anyway, it all was a game and a scam. They wasn't doing anything. They wasn't doing anything, looking for him or anything. And I was getting ready to hire a private detective, and she knew about the 5th District. And she went over to check and see where Marty's case was, and she came back and let me know and let us know it hadn't been assigned to anybody. They weren't doing anything on Marty's case. And wow. um, that's when I got with Mr. Henderson Long, and we started doing advocating, and uh, we had a little rally down there in front of a municipal center, and... Um, then they started to, they said, another, no, the captain, Captain Dickerson, my daughter called her, I'm sorry, and, her, and blessed her out, rather, and she assigned it to a new detective, and that's when they began to uh, take any interest in trying to do anything about finding Marty, but, you know, they didn't start even looking for him and stuff until after that happened, and that was 30, over 30 days later, it was about 60 days later, yeah. my grandson had actually been murdered the day he went missing. And so you work with Henderson Long, a good friend of mine, uh, a great champion for missing persons, and you all went searching for Marty. Yes, we did. And it wasn't just one night, one time. You you constantly were looking for Marty because you didn't believe what the rest of the world was saying about Marty. Right. They and kept saying that he was missing, and I had... Uh, visions, dreams, and everything, and I told him, no, Marty was gone, my, my grandson, you know, has been murdered, and, uh, or, he's not, he, my grandson's no longer in this world, that I believe my grandson, uh, is gone. Yes. Now, push come to shove, they eventually find Marty. Uh, yes, a construction worker found his remains on Suitland Parkway, they were out there doing some work. And Marty's remains was found out there wrapped in a blanket on the side 
Now, six months has passed. Um, you you received the word that he's passed away, um, but it is precocious the way he passed away. Right. Can you tell everyone exactly what you felt the moment you heard how he was treated in his last moments? Yes, uh, and I was told that by a news reporter by the name Mark Seagraves yes. who did research and came to my house to sit down and told me what had happened to my grandson. And my grandson was killed in the apartment where he went to see the girl, uh, her boyfriend or something, came home. And Marty was there with the girl, I guess, in the bedroom or something. Anyway, he shot my grandson seven times. Um, they took his body and uh, took it over there and threw it out on the highway. Mm. On the parkway. Firstly, you know how I feel about that. I am so very sorry that you have to re, re spin in that fashion. <laughs> it's all right. You know, um, but... You love Marty with all of your heart. They finally arrest someone who they believe did the crime, the killing. Uh, and they bring a second degree murder charge against him. What of the young woman that set him up? What does she get out of this deal? We had to fight for them to do that. And we had to fight for them to bring charges against her and they finally charged her with accessory of the fact, after the fact. Um, they find it out that she cleaned up the, uh, helped to clean up the crime scene in the apartment where Marty was shot up. And, um, and so they was going to use her at first. They were trying to get her to testify against Matt Gray. And, you know, she, she wouldn't do that. She took the fifth. Mm. So then they charged her with accessory to the fact that now uh, she hasn't she hasn't been in jail or anything. She's out on her own cognizance, and nor have we been to trial with her. Now, now um, ha, has it has any reported remorse? Does she have any remorse whatsoever regarding that situation that you know of? Shows none. When I see her in court, she shows none. Um, neither does to make right. So I have walked in the courtroom, and by now they know who I am, and they actually looked at me. And so I am getting on their nerves, uh, and you know, like I'm the you know, what is what like what is your problem? Exactly. Now, now a lot of people think that they've watched Perry Mason long enough. They've watched CSI. They've watched all these particular shows, and they think when you get to court, it's one, two, three. Uh, letter of the law, and then, you know, th that person's locked up forever. Yeah. Have you found that to be the case? No, because we had a meeting this week, and the case is supposed to have been, the trial is supposed to have been in September this year. Well, we got a call the other day from the prosecutor to call in everybody on Wednesday. We called in. They have now come up with a plea. They are convincing us, have convinced my daughter and his father to take a plea because they don't want to go to trial. They feel we wouldn't win. And if we went before trial, the jury would not find Matt Gray guilty. And therefore, we need to take the plea. The plea that they have convinced my family to take is 16 to 20. Um because he's in some type of box or some type of category. And because he's in that, that's what he would get in the District of Columbia. Uh, they convinced me them to, uh, my family to accept that plea. So that, pl that plea is not a first-degree murder charge, no, which would be like... No, they down and said they would not be able to prove in court. Wow. Uh, to a jury that is first-degree, so... Did it break the max twenty? Did did it break your heart when you yeah, heard that? Yeah. 
And, and why did it break your heart? Because Marty died a tragic death. They know that this man killed. The evidence leads to that. If he's going to plead guilty, then he has to be guilty. Yeah. Why would you give him? And Marty, he was 42 years old. My grandson was 21 years old. Oh, that man was old enough to be his father. He shot him seven times, seven times. Overkill. Throw his body out there that way. Then they go on with their life as though they thought they was going to get caught because they did not expect for Marty's body to be found, remains to be found. And thinking they're going to go on with life. And that young lady was there to see the whole thing and said nothing. And then they're just going to give him that amount of time. Marty doesn't have a chance to come back and to live his life. He's gone forever. Can you imagine what my grandson was feeling after he turned his life around? He was trying to do the right thing. He was feeling good about himself. To end up like this, to end up dying this way. My grandmother told me I was doing good. I do the right thing and this is how I die. This is how I'm going to die. I'm quite sure something was going through his mind when he was dying. Something was going through his mind. He got paid. He didn't even get to see his paycheck. Mm. His first little paycheck for doing overtime. He didn't get to see that. I bought him a car. He only had it three weeks. And then somebody else, they gave his car to some race shot or whatever. The guy was riding around in Marty's car. Just like it was his. They just went on with life as though they had done nothing wrong. How can you be so heinous? How much a heinous crime got to be? How evil's got to be before you bring about serious justice? With all the killing that we have in the District of Columbia, with all the people that have these people have killed people, your daughter, and people that don't even have justice, how are we going to send a message to these killers and we keep letting them get away with these minimal sentences? And we don't show them that we must stand up against these killers. You take a life, you do life. Well, there's some people, police, for this year, uh, that talk to us face to face in great boldness and say, you don't want to put another black man in jail now, do you? Huh. And you know what I say to them? And you don't want another black on black killing, do you? <laughs> I laugh at this and you have to, unless you go crazy because your child that you love so much is often used as a political piece of psychological and social warfare. Uh, and you know how much you love your child and you know that that child was due to give you great grandchildren. Mine was to give me grandchildren and that thing will never happen. Right. And for many people, life doesn't matter at no. all. But for you, it does. Yes. And you'll be sitting in that courtroom when they do give the sentence, the judge gives the sentence. I want to ask you, why is it important for people to send you letters right now about Marty and about murder? So now I can show the judge how many taxpaying, law-abiding citizens in this country is sick and tired of being sick and tired of these lenient ways when it comes time to them taking lives. Mm -hmm. How we are tired of this and we deserve justice, all of us. And it's time for it to stop. And how many people literally are standing up for this and being ignored? And how many more this is going to happen to that it hasn't happened to yet and it will happen and it will continue to happen if the legislators don't change these laws in reference to murder. First of all, there needs to be a federal offense. Murder needs to be federal mm. in all states and all over the country. Mm -hmm. It needs to hold the highest penalty because lives, lives are the highest and most important thing that we have on earth. Yeah. If you don't have a life, you don't have nothing. 
Exactly. Felicia, there are people out there that say, you know, I'm praying for you. I feel sorry for you. Is that something that you need to hear, that you want to hear, or is there something more that people can do? Yes, we need to stand together and do something. Feeling sorry and not taking action to get things to change, then it's going to continue to be the same way. And don't no one know who's next. Yes. No one knows. Felicia, we have your email address up here. We have recorded this particular interview. By tomorrow morning, we will put it out there for you to share and for everyone to share. I'm going to encourage each and every one of you to send a letter. And it's not a matter, they don't have to know Marty McMillan Jr. Right. But you know the heart that this woman, this woman is in blessed tears yes. years after the killing because there is a young woman who watched her son die in the bed who will walk away dusting her hands saying I can go on with my life nothing will ever happen to me and there's another man who's done the killing but you live in the District of Columbia which is more and more appreciative of the criminal than of the victim and is very likely to let this person off, not with 16 years or 20 years, uh-huh. more like four to eight. Uh-huh. And that, that cycle continues. You know if you are the victim of an unresolved homicide, you should be writing a letter to Felicia Cook, encouraging her and encouraging the judge for the ultimate price to be paid by the one who has dealt the ultimate blow to another person's life. It's amazing how much mercy we have for people who have no remorse for what they've done. Felicia, we love you dearly. When is this court case again? Uh, I don't know when we go off a sentence. They'll get back to us whenever, but we had to turn the plea in a matter of days, and I think my daughter, they have to make sure it's in there by next week. All right. I don't know when the sentence is, but I will have these letters to take with me to the sentence, and I will send a copy to the prosecutors and everyone else I can send it to with all the letters of people standing up against this type of options that we have, legislations, and things that we have when it comes down to dealing with murders in this country, especially in the District of Columbia. Ladies and gentlemen, it's right there on the screen for you, F-O-R-L-E-S-L-O-V-E at Comcast.net. Send your letters uh, and great love for Felicia Cook and her grandson, Marty McMillian, Marty McMillan Jr., uh, young man turning his life around, turning his life around, and the best thing that we can do is allow people to walk away from the crime that was committed. Felicia Cook, we love you dearly, and we'll be following up with you uh, as we get closer and closer to that particular date and time. Thank you so much for having me, and I appreciate all of your thoughts and your prayers. God bless you. God bless you, too. Ladies and gentlemen.